Welcome to another deep dive. Today, um, we're going to be exploring the life of Cormac McCarthy. Oh, okay. The acclaimed author who passed away earlier this year. His novels like Blood Meridian and No Country for Old Men are known for their gritty realism and exploration uh, of the darker sides of human nature. Right. But despite his fame, McCarthy was incredibly private. Mm. He rarely gave interviews. So much of his personal life has remained a mystery. Until now, that is... Exactly. Recently, a woman named Augusta Britt has come forward, claiming to have been McCarthy's lover and muse for several years, starting when she was just 16. Wow. Yeah, it's... Uh, this revelation has sparked quite a stir in the literary world, to say the least. To put it mildly, Britt shared her story in a recent Vanity Fair article, and it's, well, it's a wild ride. She paints a picture of McCarthy that's both familiar and completely unexpected. Right. And raises so many questions about his life, his inspirations, and how we interpret his work. Hey, before we continue, remember to subscribe to stay informed. So let's start at the beginning. According to Britt, their paths first crossed in 1977 at a motel pool in Tucson, Arizona. Wow. And get this, she was carrying a stolen Colt revolver at the time. Oh, wow. I mean, talk about a memorable first impression. This detail alone speaks volumes about Britt's background. Right. The article describes a difficult childhood marked by violence and instability. Carrying that gun was a way to protect herself. Yeah. A sign of the tough exterior she developed. It's almost hard to imagine this troubled teenager striking up a conversation with a famous author. But that's exactly what happened. Wow. Britt recognized McCarthy from the author photo on the back of The Orchard Keeper, a book she happened to be reading at the time. What are the odds? It's like something out of one of his novels. Right. According to Britt, she just wanted to get her book signed. But their connection was undeniable, and they embarked on a relationship that same year. 1977. Now, this is where the timeline gets really interesting. That same year, McCarthy began researching Blood Meridian, his epic Western novel about a gang of scalp hunters on the U.S.-Mexico border. Yeah. And guess what? Britt claims she traveled with him to Mexico during that research trip. And she describes traveling along the very same path that's featured in the book. Wow. So we have this real-life journey mirroring the fictional journey unfolding in the novel. It raises questions about how much of Britt's experience, her perspective, might have seeped into McCarthy's writing. It's like life and art blurring together. Exactly. But their adventure wasn't without its dangers. Mm. Britt claims they faced the very real threat of legal trouble. Mm. Remember, she was 16 and McCarthy was 42. Right. He was terrified of being charged with statutory rape or violating the Mann Act, which prohibits transporting minors across state lines for immoral purposes. It's a stark reminder of the power dynamics at play. Mm -hmm. And it makes you wonder, what was McCarthy thinking? Was it reckless abandon or something more? We can only speculate. But this episode definitely casts a shadow over their romance. Absolutely. Now, Britt alleges that her influence extends beyond Blood Meridian. She claims that traces of her can be found in at least 10 of McCarthy's novels. For example, she sees herself reflected in the character of Llewellyn Moss's young wife in No Country for Old Men. And it's interesting you bring up that book. Both the novel and the Coen Brothers film adaptation emphasize the age difference between Llewellyn and his wife, just like the real-life dynamic between McCarthy and Britt. It makes you wonder if McCarthy was consciously or subconsciously drawing on his own experiences when creating those characters. Was he trying to capture something about their relationship, its complexities and contradictions? It's certainly a possibility, and it adds a whole new layer to our understanding of those stories. So we have this intense, potentially illicit relationship unfolding against the backdrop of McCarthy's writing. But it couldn't last forever, could it? No, it didn't. According to Britt, things fell apart in 1981 when she discovered that McCarthy was not only much older, but also still married to his second wife, Annie Delisle. And to make matters even more complicated, he had a son who was roughly the same age as Britt. That must have been a devastating blow for her. Yeah. To find out the man you're involved with is not only still married, but also a father to someone your own age. It's hard to even imagine. It's a betrayal on multiple levels. And it adds another layer to the already complex ethical questions surrounding their relationship. For sure. So that's the end of the love story, right? They go their separate ways and never see each other again. Well, not exactly. This is where things take another unexpected turn. According to Britt, they parted ways in 1981, but surprisingly, they maintained some form of contact for decades. McCarthy even visited her in Tucson every few months until his death in 2023. Hold on, so even though their romantic relationship ended, they stayed connected for over 40 years. 
That's fascinating. What kind of contact did they have? The specifics are a bit unclear, but Britt suggests it was a mix of visits, phone calls, and letters. And that last part, the letters, is particularly intriguing because it ties into a major development in the world of McCarthy scholarship. You're talking about the release of McCarthy's archives. Exactly. The second half of his archives are scheduled to be released to the public very soon, and they're being housed at Texas State University. We're talking about a treasure trove of materials, manuscripts, early drafts, notes, and yes letters. So Britt's correspondence with McCarthy could be in there. It's very possible. And if those letters exist, they could provide a whole new perspective on their relationship and its influence on his work. Hmm. Imagine reading Britt's words from that time, her thoughts and feelings about McCarthy and their experiences together. It would be like hearing her side of the story directly, unfiltered by time and memory. I'm getting chills just thinking about it. It's like a literary time capsule waiting to be opened. It really is. <laughs> and it has the potential to change how we understand McCarthy's work. For years, scholars have been poring over his novels, looking for clues about his life and inspirations. Right. They analyze his characters, his themes, his language, trying to piece together the puzzle of who he was and what motivated him. And these letters could provide missing pieces of that puzzle. Potentially. They could offer insights into his creative process, his relationships, his personal struggles. Hmm. For example, scholars have long debated the significance of the violence in McCarthy's books. Was he simply reflecting the harsh realities of the world, or was there something deeper going on? Right. Some critics argue that his work is overly bleak, nihilistic even, while others see a profound moral vision. A search for meaning amidst the chaos. Exactly. And these letters could shed light on McCarthy's own thoughts about these themes. Did he see himself as a nihilist, or did he believe in something beyond the violence and despair? Did his relationship with Brit, with all his complications, influence his perspective on these matters? It's like we're getting a chance to look behind the curtain, to see the man behind the myth. And it's a chance to reevaluate his work with fresh eyes to consider how these personal experiences, these relationships, might have shaped his writing, his characters, his worldview. This is where things get even more interesting. Mm -hmm. Remember how in the first part we talked about how Britt claimed she was the inspiration for certain characters in McCarthy's books? Yes, she specifically mentioned Llewellyn Moss's wife in No Country for Old Men. Right. Now imagine if we find letters from Britt to McCarthy written during the time he was working on that novel. We could compare her words, her experiences, to the character's portrayal in the book. We could see if there are any direct parallels, any echoes of her life in his fiction. That would be incredible. It would offer a whole new level of depth to our analysis of that book. We could see if those claims of her being a muse hold any weight. It's like a literary detective story. And the clues are hidden in these archives. It makes you wonder what else might be in those letters. What secrets, what confessions, what glimpses into McCarthy's soul might they reveal? This brings us to another fascinating aspect of this whole story. Timing. Britt chose to come forward with her story just as these archives are about to be released. It's quite a coincidence, isn't it? It makes you wonder if she knew about the impending release and decided to share her account preemptively. Or maybe McCarthy himself anticipated this moment. Mm -hmm. Remember, Britt mentioned that he warned her about his archives becoming public one day. You're right. He told her that people would eventually learn about their relationship. It's almost as if he was preparing her for this moment, even decades ago. It makes you wonder about his intentions. Right. Was he trying to protect her or himself or both? Or maybe he wanted to ensure that her side of the story was heard, even if it couldn't be told while he was alive. It's a fascinating puzzle, and we might get some answers when those archives are open. It's like we're standing on the edge of a literary discovery, waiting to see what secrets these archives might reveal. And it goes beyond just McCarthy himself, you know? The story makes you think about all the hidden influences, mm -hmm, yes. the untold stories that shape the art we love. That's so true. Every book, every film, every painting, it all comes from somewhere. From the artist's experiences, their relationships, their joys and heartbreaks. And sometimes, those inspirations are messy, complicated, even controversial. But that doesn't diminish the art itself. No. If anything, it makes it richer, more thought-provoking. It reminds us that art isn't created in a vacuum. It's a product of human experience, with all its complexities and contradictions. And that's something to keep in mind as we grapple with this revelation about McCarthy. It's easy to get caught up in the scandal, the age gap, the potential illegality of it all. But we have to remember that we're dealing with real people here. 
with complicated emotions and motivations. And we have to be careful about imposing our own judgments on the past. Yeah. What was considered acceptable back then might be shocking by today's standards. Exactly. Our goal shouldn't be to cancel McCarthy or to dismiss his work. It's to engage with it on a deeper level, to consider how this new information might change our understanding of his characters and his themes. For example, knowing about his relationship with Brit, we might read No Country for Old Men differently. Right. Does the age difference between Llewellyn and his wife take on a new meaning? Does it make us question their relationship, their power dynamics, in a way we hadn't before? These are the kinds of questions we should be asking. And they're not easy questions to answer. There's no right or wrong answer. It's all about interpretation, about looking at the text with fresh eyes and an open mind. So what does this all mean for McCarthy's legacy? It's too early to say for sure. But I think this revelation will spark a new wave of scholarship, a reevaluation of his entire body of work. Hmm. It's a reminder that even with literary giants like McCarthy, there's always more to discover, more to understand. And that's the beauty of art. It keeps us asking questions, challenging assumptions, and engaging in conversations that matter. It's time to open up the floor to you, our listeners. What are your thoughts on this complex and multi-layered story? Does it change how you view Cormac McCarthy and his work? Leave a comment below and tell us what stands out to you about this story. How might the revelation of this relationship change the way we read McCarthy's work? That's something to ponder as we continue to explore the man and his legacy. If you're enjoying these podcasts, make sure to subscribe. Thanks once again, and we'll see you soon.